All right, Kat Matthews, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Brent. Thanks so much for having me. I feel like it's a real honour. And I had to have a little word for myself this morning. I was like, hello, I'm Kat Matthews and I'm going on a swimming <laughs> podcast for swimming. <laughs> <laughs> Did uh, 10 years ago, do you think you would ever be saying that sentence? No. <laughs> 10 years ago, goodness, I wasn't swimming. Ten, like I hadn't swum in like six years, 10 years ago. What what is your your swimming background? So I I ask listeners for for questions, which I'm going to ask later on. But uh, a lot of them are asking swimming related questions, like how have you got to the point where you where you are, which we'll get into. But what was your swimming background pre triathlon? Yeah, I, I um, openly, you know, I did swim as a kid, and I think that's pretty fundamental. I um, I did. Uh, sort of swimming lessons as they do that everyone does well I thought everyone did in um, the UK and then I did at whatever age it was nine ten transition into the local swimming club where we then properly train swimming Um, and I then did throughout my whole sort of 10 to 15 like age did two to three training sessions a week so that was maybe four hours a week by the time I was 14 15 um, you know, 7 p.m., finishing at 9, cycling home. I think um, that was pretty massive in terms of technique, and I did it really for the social scene. Like, I enjoyed it, but I didn't ever think of swimming as, a like, a faff when I was there. It was just getting there in the rain. But um, I think I think that was pretty important. I joke now that I, I was a better swimmer then. Like, I'm pretty sure I did a 100-meter freestyle in a 104, and my husband, Mark, he's like, there's absolutely no way you did that because now I obviously can't swim that quick. So, <laughs> yeah, ch- like <laughs> child swimming was, you know, pretty fundamental. But then I got a bit bored of it um, and realized there's other things I wanted to do on a Friday night, just generally. Um, and so didn't swim from maybe sort of age 17 through until 24 which I think by that point was quite a critical, you know, period of time. And swimming strokes just completely div- like changed by the time I got back into it. And um, what was that, 2015, 16? And by swimming strokes changing, you mean the way it was taught or your own stroke had changed a lot in that time? I, I meant the way it was taught. So when I was taught, it was this sort of keyhole um, come in and then push out. Um, and then by the time I started, you know, YouTubing how to learn to swim again, it was very much like, no, absolutely don't do that S. You should just do a straight arm stroke. So I sort of, I guess, like retaught myself to swim. If it sounds a bit dramatic, retaught, but got back into swimming and tried to relearn those technique points. But with this new swim, this swim style, um, the army triathlon sort of group hub were coaching the swim smooth which I know it's probably a bit of a competitor but they I didn't I never really never really got on board it it just didn't feel quite right to me but obviously you pick up little bits of technique from that um and I think as your question like I as a 15 year old to then a 24 year old or whatever the gap was you obviously your body changes a lot and my ability to propel my now adult body through the water was completely different. So I think I had to just like relearn that as well. Do you think that when you were younger, when you were a teenager, that there was a lot less thought about the technique and it was just you get in and, and you do it? And then when you get a bit older, you start to think about things more and you're more aware of technique. Is it, do you feel like that was a, there was a difference there in I guess the the thinking involved with it. Yeah, I think somewhat. I do remember as a teenager really being like really focused on my technique. I remember having the training sessions were a lot of technique, a lot of kick, which I hated, um, a lot of different mm. strokes. And I remember at one point like really progressing in one season in, you know, as a kid because I had focused on the end of my stroke and I was really finishing it and I was, you know, a couple of seconds quicker at 100 straight away. So I remember having these like significant sort of key teaching points, but yeah, I've, I've definitely learned now as an adult that I'm a visual learner and kinesthetic, like the act of movement. I'm, I think I'm really good at my body proprioception. And I think that's also come from study of physiotherapy. So I'm now probably mm. too in tune 
which can be a negative mm. with what's going on. So yeah, it becomes a bit of battle not to overanalyze the stroke. Yeah, it's a big, I think for everyone, every adult who wants to get better, I I think they, they battle with that. It's like, hey, how I really want to think about things. I'm, I'm really aware of what's going on. And in many cases, you sometimes just need to get out of your head and you need to just be in tune with how you're feeling and then just kind of get into the groove and get into the rhythm of things. Uh, but it's it's that constant battle. And I find myself doing the same thing, trying not to overthink the the stroke. And for me, and I'd be curious to hear if it's for you, the sessions where I where I swim the best, the races where I do the best are usually the ones where I'm I'm not overthinking the stroke. I'm just but trying to be really aware of the race conditions and just getting into a into a groove that I feel like I can sustain for the race. And when I look back at it, there's no uh it's a little bit of a blur when I look back at the the swim. I can remember moments in time, but it's I, I feel like I'm really in flow, I guess is probably the way to put it. What is is it the same for you? Do you sort of find that or or something different? I'd be curious to hear your your perspective there. No, I think I think so. I'm not sure I've got enough of a bank of good swims to um to really build a <laughs> this this is, you know, the norm now and this is how I feel when it goes well. I think the biggest thing for me is stop like you said, yeah, just like maybe just stopping thinking about technique. But I definitely I definitely get a lot from thinking about my body position more than the stroke technique. So I feel like, especially at the start of every training session or mid race, it becomes less about, oh my goodness, that stroke wasn't quite good enough because of the, you know, the ocean swell or something. It's more about head and lower back bum sort of position that makes me feel ground, like grounded. Um, I don't know if that's the right word, but I think that, that bit rather than the technique of the swim stroke i think i sort of go back to mm. yeah it's because the first thing you need to do is you need good body position you need to minimize drag first and foremost because if your hips and legs are dropping you're going to be slow and no matter how fit you are you're just going to slow yourself down so i think it's a, a great first principle to always come back to is is body position and how you're sitting so is that something that if you're not having a great swim training session, do you feel like you sit lower in the water or are there other things that you feel like uh, that aren't quite working for you, whether it's the timing or like your heart rate's a little bit higher? What are those kinds of things where you can differentiate between a, a good swim and a not so good swim? Yeah, totally. I think it's immediate, It's sort of immediately and it often comes after a hard bike or a run. Um during training is the body position so i i immediately feel that i'm lower through my hips and then i'm therefore not sort of able to get on top of the front of my stroke so it just doesn't feel like i'm moving at all mm. whereas i don't think i ever had that good feeling before so i think now i know what that feels like because i've able to change my body position now i know what bad feels like i think that's the big change mm. this year actually <laughs> it's like someone who's constantly hung over if they're drinking every day. It's like they don't know how bad they feel until they stop drinking and then they've got this new this this new level of like oh, this feels this feels amazing. It's uh, uh yeah, yeah obviously it's a lot better if you're uh, <laughs> you're just feeling bad in the water and not hung over constantly. But uh that's a that's really interesting to hear hear you say that that you, now you get that sense of swimming swimming well. How long did it take you to get to that point where you feel that feel yourself feel good and 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 move well through the water i am actually maybe slightly unique there i'm seeing this as a bit of a silver lining of a big accident i had last year um i broke my skull didn't break my neck broke my back in a couple of places sternum hip and i couldn't lift my neck up for a while because it had been in the brace for six weeks or so and then lifting it up generally was hard and stressful. So I spent a lot of time um, in that build up at the end of last year with a snorkel, which I'd never really used before. And my husband, keen swimmer, I'll mention him a lot because he sort of feeds back in a little bit. But 
he was he's always been saying your head's too high and I was like no it's just my swimming bun like the bun under your swimming hat like I think it's just affecting your perspective <laughs> and was adamant that I couldn't get my head any lower but then this accident and the snorkel work suddenly I got my head down because it was way comfier to have my head down and that was massive for just bringing my bringing my body position back up and knowing what that should feel like mm -hmm. so then I started swimming training at the start of um this year 23 with my head in a better position and then so sort of suddenly I was able to be like oh you know even though way weaker mm. that's what I should be feeling like in the water so it's maybe not the norm but I think the snorkel really helped regardless of the accident just allowing myself that time to use the snorkel and feel a different body position that's great to hear about the improvement that you've being able to get from from a from a negative that that happened last last year, and I'll, I want to go into that a little bit more as well in in a moment. In terms of your your head position, so was he saying that you're your head, you're holding your head too high, or that you're looking too far forwards? I never felt like I was looking too far forwards. You know, I would watch your videos and be like, "There's the uh, forty five degree angle." Like I always felt like, "Yeah, I'm not looking for the end of the pool." but I'm looking somewhere in the middle. If not, I was sort of even just like looking at the floor sometimes to try and bring my head down. But I think it was physically my head was out of the water. Um, and the other caveat is that swimming in a public lane in England, normally you are in a 25 metre pool and there's other people in the lane doing lots of odd <laughs> to you things. And so you're constantly looking for the end of the pool and you're constantly looking to see if you're going to swim into someone suddenly who's swimming three minutes per hundred meter pace. Um, so I think that there was that element as well. Like I never had a natural sort of the freedom to get my head down and eyes down and sort of practice that in a, in a pool. Whereas another change that happened at exactly the same time is that I've now started swimming deliberately in like a 50 meter local pool where the fast lane is actually full of people who are swimming off a 90 base. Yeah, that's, I, someone sent me some footage that I, I do coaching with and uh, they were swimming, I'm trying to think where they were, got enough off the top of my head, but I know I've, I've been to Germany once and we went to a pool, no lane ropes at all. It's just a free for all in there. And you go, how to, how can you not swim with your eyes looking directly forwards? How can you not have your head really high when that's the case? And that's like the worst case scenario. But then if you're in a, in lanes where there's just people doing all sorts of things in there, it's it's very hard to have that good good head position so it just becomes becomes a norm so i think there's a big benefit to changing your environment and that environment for you is going to that 50 meter pool with good swimmers in that lane where you, you can actually get your head down uh it, it can make such a difference and i work a lot with uh the age group triathletes sort of swimmer people who are new to swimming or, or pretty new to it and maybe didn't learn as a kid or had a little bit of experience as a kid, but mostly they've been doing it for a couple of years as an adult. And I'd say, I'd say two thirds of the people that I work with, their heads are either holding up too high in the water or they're looking too far forwards, but they think they're looking in the right spot. And it's not until we show them on the video where we go, this is where it is. You can see it. And they go, okay, like, yeah, I didn't think I was, I was doing that. So there's just such a disconnect from what people think they're doing to what they're actually doing. And it sounds like it was the the same for you. And there's just so much stuff in swimming like that, uh, especially in in the water where you haven't got, you're not grounded and you can't really see what's going on. It's just such a disconnect there. So that's why I think like coaching can be helpful. Um, that kind of feedback, like self-feedback when you're using a snorkel or just video analysis, it can make such a such a difference. So the fact that uh, that, that came out of the the accident is quite um quite remarkable i think that uh that it's been able to make such a such a difference was there anything after making that change where uh so you said you felt like you could kind of get on top of your, your catch a bit more when you had that better head position yeah and another key part was that i was actually doing kick because i couldn't because my back i couldn't um do a lot of pull, like swimming and pull and so i was doing a lot more kick um and i think Therefore, I got more confident with my kick, again, with fins, because I wouldn't have been moving forwards otherwise. Um, 
I then was able to use that kick in my swimming. And I think that's another massive change this year uh, is that my kick is actually functional, which is obviously two, two uh, factors important because one, it enables me to maintain that higher body position, which I don't think I had before. It also helps, I think, the kicking as a separate entity training would help with my core generally, which again, helps the body position. But then also the speed in terms of get out speed for racing, I think that that's now something I'm actually really confident mm. in. So I think the kicking as well as the head position were sort of tied together. Oh, that's that's great to hear. And the, yeah, the kick, it, so many people, age group triathletes, they go, oh, I don't kick at all. And it's not that you really have to kick much, especially as just like an, an average age grouper necessarily, because you may not need that get out speed like like you do in a, in a race. But the, the main thing with the kick is, I, I love the word functional that you use. It's like, if you can kick the right way, then it gives you, it kind of gives you a little bit of that that grounding and that ability to anchor. Like someone who's throwing a, a baseball where they've got their feet planted on the ground. We don't have that in the water. So an, an effective kick or a functional kick will actually give you something to be able to anchor against when you're when you're pulling. And as you said, it sort of connects up with your hips and your core and that's where you feel like you've got something to pull against. Uh, and then the combination of having a, a functional kick when you need it, you know, you can bring in a six speed kick if you have to, to try and make that front pack. Or if you've got to find feet, you know, you've got to catch up to someone, you can bring it in when you need to, and then you can drop back to a two beat or a four beat if you have to. So that's, um, yeah, that's, a, it's such a great thing to, um, to develop. And were you, were you aware of that prior to improving that? Like, were you aware that you're, your kick wasn't necessarily functional or was it just something that you started to realize as you started to do more kick? I think I was definitely in the camp of, oh, I don't need to kick. Like I barely, I barely kick. So therefore I don't need to really train it. I had worked on kick timing quite a lot um, from, you know, the last couple of years. So I was pretty happy, you know, last year of, you know, that my one kick per one reach sort of thing worked really well. And it was like one decent kick. It felt good enough. But I think I always thought it could be better if I was to ever kick against someone, my husband, he'd just destroy, like I'd be useless. So I started thinking, right, why not again with the accident? Like why not do more kick because I can physically do it. So I might as well practice it while I can. And again, fins in a 50 meter is way easier than fins in a 25 because you're at the end by 12 seconds or something. So mm. I think, again, another sort of opportunity area there. Mm. And it, it, can you tell me about what sort of kick sets you were doing? Like, did you have the snorkel on? You have the fins on? Were you going hard for 50? Were you doing kick uh, sets of 400? What, what did those kick sets look like? My kick sets have very little structure and it's more like, how can you possibly get through <laughs> 400 meters? Do it as best you can. Um, I did one yesterday, as in I'm going to do 500 meters of kick. And I did a hundred, like I was just, I just braked when I need to do, or someone was in, I was in someone else's way. Um, you know, 100 meters with fins, 50 meters harder with fins. Come on, try and make 45 seconds. Try and go off 50 seconds, not a minute. Um, I remember it used to take me a minute in a 25 meter pool without fins, um, I think. And so by the end, I was absolutely, you know, this is with a float as well. I would way, obviously way prefer to do it with a float, but lots of the times I would do maybe a hundred meters with a float, a hundred meters without, and then I might do a hundred meters, six, three, six to try and like incorporate it back into a bit of the stroke. Um, but I have been trying mm. to do some without fins. It's not it's not very fun at all, as you know, to do fins and then take them off and do it without. I didn't think I was moving and I was really struggling in a 50 meter yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it's I, I think it's so uh, it's just nice to hear that uh, that that has helped overall. And uh, again, the the athletes I would normally work with the the age groupers um, when we put fins on and we do drills, a lot of them are very like they're just they're too laid back with their kick so i encourage them to like get your feet moving you've got the fins on for a reason and if you just start to work your kick more in those moments in those sets that you've got your fins on or when you're doing kick sets like just be more active with it work it in the down and the up kick try and feel that undulation with it um and just train it while you while you've got the fins on 
uh, it can help develop it, develop it a lot. And yeah, if you get yourself a, a pair of, of good fins and some fins are, are not great, um, like there's some fins are really stiff and hard and uncomfortable, but if you get yourself a good pair of fins, like I like the DMC fins, DMC elite ones, or I think the arena power fins pretty similar, which is quite good. Like a good pair of fins makes a world of difference. So if you hate fins and you're listening to this, get yourself a good pair, first of all, uh, they're much more comfortable. You get more propulsion from them and, and don't get the long fins look, they're fine, but they're not as not as good for you as like a, a good pair of kind of shorter fins like the ones that I've I've mentioned. What what fins are you using? Oh, I'm honestly not sure. I've had them since, I've had them since you know three or four years. Like I'm I have no sort of they are these ones. Um, yeah, they're orange. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but I think um, orange on- fins. So get yourself a pair of orange fins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah on your note about the intensity thing i used to when i was getting back into swimming i used to definitely be guilty of that especially on when i was swimming on my own a lot i would just do kick for the sake of doing kick you know 50 meters cool 50 meters cool but now every kick i sort of dread it in a way because it's harder than swimming well that's the intensity i feel like it should be at is that i should be sort of basically racing someone mm. every time i do it because i remember that as a kid like i remember you know, cheating on the lane rope, like, can I, I can't keep up, you know, I've got to try and like do one stroke, the coach won't sort of see, like, I remember it being a real stress, the kick set. So I think Hmm. the intensity of that, yeah, that's definitely something. The other um, element of um, not just intensity, but in terms of technique is I I think uh, you or someone else might have driven um, uh, this sort of box around your kick. So like keeping the the kick within that box rather than just like my old mm. kick technique would be that sort of one bigger kick on one side. Um, so I think that was pretty pretty important in terms of reminding myself that it should be super efficient and therefore hopefully translates to swimming without the fins as well. Nice, yeah. I'll, I'll take all the credit for that. That's that's fine. Kicking in the bucket is the um the way yeah. Uh, the way I'd normally de- describe it and not a tiny bucket, but like a, a larger bucket out behind you, slightly wider than your, your body line. So it's, it's a good way to visualize it. And I like the, the cue of ballerina in a bucket because the ballerina is up on their tippy toes and then just imagine kicking in that bucket. So uh, I'll take all the credit for, for that. Thanks, Kat. Um, so <laughs> uh, going back to your, your accident uh, last year. So take me back to, to that moment. What was the first thing running through your head was it am I going to be able to race again is it uh am I going to be able to walk again what was going through your mind when that first happened I haven't really dwelled on like trying to remember that so I find it quite hard to be like this was the first thing maybe when I write a book about it (laughs) I'll have uh, I'll have dealt with it better but I think the first bit of it and the overarching sensation was just like loss um, and and grief. And it wasn't about triathlon. It was like suddenly my life was on a hospital bed and it was more that like loss of personal freedom. Like I couldn't do anything. I couldn't make decisions. I couldn't choose anything. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't necessarily about, oh, no, I can't do a triathlon. <laughs> it was I I'm not allowed to walk at the moment and I can't turn my head. So the, the doctors were very good in, out in the woodlands in Texas. They scanned everything and gave me the appropriate amount of information. And my, you know, everyone else, all my friends, my coach was there. Uh, husband got out there as soon as he could. So they gave them all the information they really needed. And me, again, just, just enough. As a physio, I was really... Um, prodding at like what's wrong um and I think there was a few uncertainties quite early on about um just the integrity of my neck blood so like uh, the art the main artery in my neck um and of course just like double checking that they weren't missing anything I think the injuries didn't quite make sense Mm. due to the trauma so I think they were even though the scan, you know, I think they wanted to double check, triple check, triple check again, just to make sure that that wasn't something that was they'd really missed. Um, so yeah, a lot of uh, 
sadness, yeah. I think, was the big one. Did you do you think it was at that time better to have your physio background or to not have it and maybe not know so much what was going on? Do you think it was helpful or or not so much? I I I think it's always helpful. I think any I think education knowledge is it was always helpful because in theory you should be therefore have the rationale to apply it appropriately. So I think knowing that they had checked my spinal cord, cool, you can stat, you can walk. Okay, cool. So then I was like, they must have done this, this, and this to be happy. It wasn't me going, oh, are you sure I can walk? You know, like, are you sh- are you sure? And I they, I had some like obviously some issues with my lungs. And I was being told to blow into these devices. Again, I would I would have freaked out probably a little bit about what this sort of, you know, how big a volume my lungs can blow it. Up. And to me, it was like I'd given that little device to about 100 people. And it was like, cool, yeah, just practice that. So I knew exactly what I had to do for the next two weeks in terms of blowing into a device and how my lungs, how important standing up, taking deep breaths, even though it hurt you know, bracing during sneezing, like all of those things that are associated to the lungs, that is actually uh, part of my, you know, experience as a physiotherapist, even though most people see physio as just sore knee, sore shoulder. Um, I don't know what it's like in other countries, but we're very grounded in our whole medical um, physiotherapy. And part of that is respiratory. So those were the biggies as well as Mm. the, you know, walking side of life. Mm. Is there anything that you can't do or can't do quite as well at the moment as a result of it, or you feel like pretty much back to normal? I saw the spinal consultant um, at like the one year point just a few weeks ago, and he he came. He said a phrase that I now I really like. He says, "Trauma leaves clues," and I I found it really hard for the first six months, especially then I got back racing and everything was fine for people to be like, oh, cool, you're healed now. And I was like, <laughs> uh, I think that's the, the the trouble with this sort of injury. The tr- it can be a trouble is that the psychological uh, trauma is an entity and then the physical trauma is an entity and anything to do with the spine It doesn't necessarily just fix like a 10 year old's wrist would just fix um, or a tendon would just heal after loading it. So I think um, there are things that will always be a little bit different with my movement and just general sort of the integrity of those bits that were broken. But physically, I'm now acting without any, you know, reservation. I think I realized over the summer and, Mm. you know, that sort of eight month point, I wasn't worried about it anymore. I wasn't thinking, oh, you know, every so often it was just, I'm able to move. I'm able to breathe. I'm able to sneeze. I'm able to, you know, attack a hill climb on the bike. I'm able to sprint on the run. There was nothing that was like, oh, not sure about that. Or even just a consideration of the, the overload. So my body is a bit different, but at the moment it's not. There's no problems with that. Yeah, it, it sounds like that. That's a bit of a turning point where you're not. It's not like there all the time. Like, oh, okay, I felt felt that. Where you get to that point where you can just operate as normal. You can train as as normal, and, and maybe you know, maybe you might pull up a bit sore here and there, but uh, it's not not restrictive. Where where you be kind of limited in your in your sessions there. So that's um, it's great to hear you at, at that point. And come, coming to this year at to get po- uh, podium at the 70.3 world champs take me to to that moment when you cross the finish line or you're on the podium what was that like for you because i i can't imagine how much rehab how much work you would have had to go through in a couple of months time to uh to get to that point and to uh to make it back when yeah maybe that could have been the the end of your racing career yeah i think it looks it looks like a bigger deal than it maybe felt because I never allowed that Mm. consideration of it could be it. Um, When I say I, like my husband was from day one, cool, you're going to be back. You'll be fine. You'll be better than ever. And I just drove off that. Like it wasn't a consideration Mm. or it, 
it might have flickered across my mind, but it wasn't, I had never allowed myself to dwell on it. So the rehab was just the same as doing my job, you know, training. Um, yes, sure. There was moments where it was really hard, but the, by the time I got to the summer, it was, I was working just as hard as everyone else or, you know, the same ish. Um, and so it wasn't necessarily anything in my mind that was like super spectacular on reflection, obviously mm. there was a much lower starting point at the start of the year, but again, everybody has these, you know, big, big ish injuries that sometimes set them back in life. Um, so I think it was it was pretty valuable to me in terms of my physiology, like the confidence in my physiology that I'm still improving. That was big. So my performance was pretty good. And my running consistency over the summer leading up into Lati was better than ever. So I think those things were just to then put it into a race was really nice. It's, it's so hard as, you know, as doing the sport to have this constant battle of, I know I can do this physically in training but so what if I can't do it in a race so I think that was the biggest thing was this sort of relief of my training is real this is how fit I am because I can show it in a race I think side note I think we often get sort of sidetracked by how we think we're better than we are just because we can do it in training whereas actually I see performance level as the race and I think that's maybe why when it goes wrong it hits you so bad because you haven't got this you haven't got this. It's okay. I can do it in training. It's that no, that race was all that mattered. And your training is completely relevant, useless, you know, pointless because you haven't been able to show it in the race. <laughs> Sounds like a bit of a, a double-edged sword in a way where the, if you put the, put the importance on, on your race results, that means you can, can do it. It's like, that is, uh, that's the real, that's the real test. And that, and for you, yeah, where you have to prove yourself in in the race, I think that, that it can be a great thing. And then, obviously, when it doesn't go right, that's when it can can hit you. And that and the mental side of it can be uh, can be quite difficult. Uh, I had a, a, a listener send in a question about training the mental aspect and the and the mindset aspect. And there's two things that you mentioned just before that that stood out to me. There, one is after the injury, and your husband was saying, "All right, you'll be back. All right, this is this is just what we'll do. We'll get we'll get back to it. Where it's not." not a big deal. It's like, we'll just get on with it and we'll do what we need to do. That sounded like a, an interesting approach that seemed to, to make a, a big difference for you where you don't make it, build it up as this huge thing in your head. It's just, it's no big deal. Let's get on with it. And then the second thing there that you mentioned as, as well is putting that importance on proving yourself in, in a race, because I know a lot of, I know a lot of triathletes, a lot of swimmers who are great trainers and they will do some, I've seen some amazing sessions by them, but they can't put it together in a race. And from the outside, it seems like they put too much effort into some of their training sessions where, you know, maybe they push harder than they need to because they're trying to prove themselves in training and not the race. What are your thoughts around those, those two things? Does, it, does that sound about right? Because um, yeah, it just, it sounded quite interesting to me listening to you explain those couple of things. No, totally. I love, I'd love to, um, to, I could talk about them way too long for the podcast, but the first one, um, cause it's easier. Um, yeah, my husband's attitude was, I think, fundamental to my, uh, sort of mental health in those first few months. So it was, it wasn't just this, he was in the, he was in the army, had been for years now left his sort of like, cool, you know, let's crack on. It was more, uh, um, I think he needed to feel super confident that I would be totally fine. And so it was for both of us, it was the easiest way of being like, cool, it will be fine. You know, we were as a, as an entity, he'd left the army. We were going to go both, you know, go forward this year with my professional sport. There wasn't also really a choice. It was just cool. You know, let's just sort of, um, it will all be fine. He, doesn't stress as in he's one of those people who doesn't worry I'm a worrier so it's it was <laughs> no, it was like normal for us for him to not worry and then if I started worrying he'd do the head pat it's okay I'd cry a little bit and it would be like <laughs> it's okay 
and then you know next day cool let's be it and it wasn't it wasn't ever a sort of super over the top positivity it was just a the perfect level of mm. um confidence and supporting not accepting that it was a really bad situation because i think that would be easy not to allow those emotions and not to allow that sadness but he um, and my family and friends got the perfect balance of letting me be super sad um but equally um giving me the space to breathe before then deciding myself which is how it normally works for me like in an off season like deciding myself that I'm ready to try and do a bit more on that as well my physio is really important um I had moved to Loughborough um new environment new house new swimming pool new physio um the day we got back from Kona um and uh I went to see her for the first time and I was like, yes, yeah, so I had all these, had all these injuries. And we looked at my thoracic rotation and my neck rotation. She's like, so when are you racing? <laughs> and this is like week seven. And so <laughs> that was a big, like, Oh, <laughs> steady on, you know, I don't really know you. Um, that's not how I work. Like I need to feel confident in myself before I, um, you know, even think about racing. And it was just sort of honestly later in that day, I was like, mm, actually, she was right. When am I racing? Like, <laughs> I need to, she suggested, say, like from a physio perspective, what do you need to be able to do 12 weeks away from a race? Um, you know, and therefore, what do you need to be able to do 16 weeks away from a race, sort of thing? And so I then got out my Excel spreadsheet and started making these little, like, okay, well, if I was to race in April, by March, I need to have done. I think my confidence would be like two 20 hour training weeks or something back to back as it sort of as a fitness entity, like tolerate the load. Um, I need to be able to swim at least 20 K a week sort of thing for a month. Those little markers because of what she said became my tangible, like just reachable goals for the next six weeks. So it was pretty important. Um, mindset like mentality wise and then back to the other part of training versus racing I think it's something that we like really people are quite divided on it I think lots of people will always be like oh wow she's so good at training she'll be excellent she is excellent um and I've always been the opposite so it's easy for me to say I need to show it in a race for it to be factual because I'm not a great trainer. I don't think like I don't, I don't beat my, I wouldn't beat my competitors in training. Even if I, that same day or later that day, I'd then race and we'd, I'd actually beat them. So I've never, and I've never really trained in an environment where it is competitive like that to try and beat my um, sort of friends. So I've never, had that comparison um my power in training is in my like intervals for example swimming cycling and running is always way better than I'm able to do in a race but I think that's normal I think that was that's sort of obvious like obviously it's better in training when it's a shorter rep so I think some people perhaps just get confused that if they can do it in a in a training session therefore they can do it in a race whereas the race is obviously way longer and has way more other factors involved. So I might be swimming like uh, 75s um, long course threshold, um, but I don't think I can do that actual threshold for an hour. Like I don't, I don't think I can. So if I then do 80 seconds per 100 in a race, then I'm pretty happy of that normally. So I think some people have this slight mismatch maybe of what – those training values really mean. And for me, it's always just been about the mm. performance because that is what you're training to, to do. But I don't know if that's just like mm. my, my mindset of that sort of ethos. But I do think that that's where you show mental strength or resilience or just aptitude, aptitude to, to employing strategic or resilient techniques, whether that's conscious or subconscious 
in the race is where it shows. So you can be excellent for a 10 minute rep in training because you're just going to jump off and have a shower and go to work. But if you're not like, if you're not able to just be focused and mentally strong, whatever that means in a race where you've still got half marathon to run, then so what if you can do a 10 minute rep? Mm. Yeah, that's uh, when you, when you say you're a, when you say you're not a great trainer, do you, can you, can you clarify that a little bit? Do you, as in, are you, do you feel like you don't train as hard as you could, or do you feel like, uh, like the numbers that you put out, um, could be like, they're just not as much as some of your competitors, but you are better in racing. Can you clarify that a little bit? Because, uh, I think when someone, when someone hears that, um, yeah, maybe they might interpret it as, you know, you don't like maybe faff about a bit here and there. Um, and I'm guess I'm guessing you don't, right? Like I'm just, just curious to, um, yeah, to get your, your thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm absolutely not saying that I'm not, <laughs> I'm again, I don't, I train with some people sometimes, um, and this year loads more than previously. And I have a, I like, as an example, I have like a semi different personality when I've actually got a session as opposed to just an aerobic session. Like I become really, I become a less nice person because I'm so focused. Like I'm not able to tolerate chat in the rep. Like I, it's just about the rep. Like everything okay. is perfection. The rest is purely rest, rest or eating or drinking. Go, like go again. Let's chat at the end of the session when we've got an hour and a half easy riding or, um, you know, in the showers after swimming sort of training. And um, so I think my, when I say I'm not a good trainer, I mean more every session that has to be 10 out of 10 effort is 10 out of 10 effort, nine and a half, some bad days, or it's 10 out of 10 effort and just not very good. Um, but a lot of my sessions are seven out of 10 sessions, you know, or they have a little bit of eight out of 10 in there. And it's only seven out of 10 or eight out of 10 RPE that I'm doing. I'm not putting, I'm not doing my um, threshold reps at 100%. And then thinking, oh my goodness, my, my threshold is 70 seconds, not 75 seconds. For example, obviously it's not the same swimming as it is on the, on the bike. But um, so I think that's sort of important. Like it's the discipline of training control. And I have noticed mainly in cycling and run volume that my competitors do a lot more than me. And some age groupers, um, I hate that word, some amateur triathletes will do um, four hour rides at like averaging um, over three watts a kilo, you know, 3.5 watts a kilo. And they're two kilometers an hour faster than me over the same route or something. Strava is dangerous. And, um, <laughs> and then I beat them by like half an hour in a race. So over four hours or over two hours even. So I think I know that I'm, mm. I have that um, sort of intensity control and discipline in training. Not that I am, I mean, like I'm not a good performer in training. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like you you're smart about your training, not trying to overdo it when there's no there's no need to to push it more just for the for the Strava numbers or to prove to yourself that you can do can do those numbers. And I th and that's a trap that a lot of people fall into, whether it's because of Strava or they just like to compete. They like to challenge themselves. I know I'm guilty of it on on occasion, just going harder than I need to in an aerobic based session because. I want to get a good workout. I want to see what times I can hit. It is hard to restrain yourself sometimes, uh, but I think that's a good ethos that you've got of that your performance. It's it doesn't matter in training. It, it's about the race. So that, that's it. And it, you want to go with what works well for you. And it sounds like you've thought a lot about the things that work well, the things that don't, and you've evolved over the last couple of years of training and and racing, and probably figured some of those things out. When it comes to thinking and or looking back at past performances and the way that you do things do you have a sort of structure that you that you follow do you review it annually do you sit down with your coach and go through it every six months what's that look like for you do you mean like a sort of 
as in like January to March race season? Yeah, just in terms of uh, adjusting training and the way you go about things, do you have a, a, a structure to to analyzing that or is it usually after after a race you do it each time and and then tweak things or have you have you got a, a general structure that you'd follow for that? I'm not really sure. I think I rely and I'm happy to like sit back sometimes sometimes and rely on my coach's expertise um Bjorn Giesman um German triathlon coach um he, and I think he, I give him the overarching control over those things um and I trust that he's looking back and seeing what works well and what doesn't me and my husband Mark we will discuss things often and often disagree and I then choose to take some of those things to Bjorn and some of them I don't um and sometimes we have a group little chat about normally issues obviously it's easier to pick up on issues but I I sort of pride myself that I'm good at also seeing the positives like going into Kona like I felt great you know first week awful new conditions environment but Coming into race week, I I honestly thought at one point I was like, wow, I could hug Bjorn. I feel so good right now. Like this this was perfect. <laughs> um, so I think yeah, that, that sort of structure. If that's if that's more what you mean, like that sort of that build into a race or even just training structure generally is totally on him. Because I'm full time, I can go away and do training camps. So. When I'm at home, my training volume is way less and it's really nice, you know, 90 minute turbos, maybe two hours, two often, sometimes three sessions a day. Whereas a training camp, you know, we're pushing out to sort of 30 plus hours in the week with three, you know, 90 minute swims, well, 75 minute swims and then three to four hours on the bike and then another hour running in the evening or a gym session. So it really fluctuates. And I think that's something that I'm really grateful for that I don't have to do all of these, you know, horrible sessions or use up loads of mental energy when I don't have to, I can sort of prioritize that into a training camp when volume is way easier. Um, so yeah, mm. I think like a bit more volume over sort of the early part of the year, and then it becomes a little bit more sort of focused perhaps. Um, in terms of intensity control, less just bulk mileage for the sake of it around races. And, and I, what you mentioned there about giving control to uh, to Bjorn or, or giving, just trusting that they know what they're they're doing. I had a, a, a professional swimmer here on the podcast recently, Guy Flynn Southern, and uh, he said the same thing. It's like I when I go to the gym, when I go to the pool, I I just I trust that my coaches know what they're doing, so I just get in there and I do what they ask and. I'm thinking about my stroke. I'm working on those things, but that way you just, it takes that mental load off and that, that, that your mental capacity, uh, yeah, you working hard, you, you're training a lot. 30 hours is a, is a huge, is a huge training week. And if you've got to think about the types of sessions you're doing, all that sort of stuff, it's, it's often too much. And so being able to, uh, just, just see that to, to someone else and someone that you trust, it can make a huge difference. And it sounds like that kind of takes the, the, a huge load off your off your shoulders, which is which is what you want as a professional triathlete. You've got a lot to think about. There's the training. There's stuff to do with sponsors. There's flights and travel and all these sorts of stuff that you've that you've got to factor in that uh, you don't need any more on your plate. And I think the I think the satisfaction of the simple, yep, done that tick. If if you're not setting the goal, it's very easy to feel that satisfaction of achieving the goal because it it's, should be achievable. Whereas if I'm setting the goal, I will often either doubt myself that that's not too hard to swimming here, or I or it's sort of too easy and it's like, have I done enough? So I think that's a massive thing for me this last 12 months as I started swimming with somebody else. Um, because yeah, like I said, moved to Loughborough, new environment. At the same time, uh, uh, sort of somebody we knew but we weren't friends with at the time also moved here Sam Proctor another British pro athlete and so me and him started swimming together and he also does some coaching and at, for the last couple of years I've just been setting my own swimming sessions whereas now I 
turn up to the pool and Sam has taken complete control of that sort of um, Monday aerobic, Tuesday we're going to do, th- you know, VO2. Um, sorry, that wasn't a good sound for a podcast. <laughs> um, that was me semi-throwing up at VO2, um, you know, and then CSS or threshold on a Friday. Like having this structure and having sessions that I I, I try not to look at the session because I'm so fearful and every, nearly every session I'm thinking I can't do this. So I'm I'm two reps into 10 or whatever it is and I'm I need to drop out, I need to drop out, I need to drop out. How do I explain? How do I like come up with some sort of, I'll do the next one as yeah. paddles or maybe I'll just take one easy while you carry yeah. on. And, and I fight that so hard nearly every session um, to just finish. And that's been the most rewarding thing thing this whole year is I've probably only dipped out of mm. sort of one or two percent of those sessions because something's wrong like I actually do have a bit of a slightly sore shoulder not just all oh, my shoulder feels sore it's like actually it was sore the other day I need to be hmm. steady on this swim for example like, I won't use paddles I just use finger paddles sort of thing um so yeah that's been massive like having somebody else dictate that training sort of session intensity and routine through the week it's so funny what your mind goes through just i've done the exact same thing it's like uh yeah what what excuse that sounds legitimate can i come up with to make it sound like i'm not being soft here and wanting to get out but nine times out of ten it's like you're being soft all right just push through it you know it'll be over soon and just in, in, uh yeah in, embrace the suck as uh as, as mac would say so uh yeah totally totally get it um, now I know you've got to go, so we'll um, we'll wrap up here. Those that are um, for those that are listening, in terms of swim advice, so you've obviously improved your swimming a lot over the last couple of years. We talked about some of those things. Do you have any other advice for for people working on their swimming if they're maybe newer to swimming and um, and and struggling with it? What what are a couple of key things that you'd or key bits of advice you give to them? Um, well, they're listening to this, so obviously they should be following your platform. Tick like key advice. (laughs) Um, I, but on that note, I found more interest in listening and watching like swimming technique rather than it being, it doesn't feel like a chore. It's like, Oh, this is interesting. And, and like thinking about that as an idea. Um, but that's pretty, like some people will find that really boring. Um, so I think physically, I think, the things we said are the things that I would think for most people. So body position rather than just thrashing yourself, but thrashing yourself is equally as important once and maybe not just once, but like all year round. I think I was guilty of not believing that I could do sessions. Um, So I think knowing that it's really hard and you're really out of breath and you feel totally out of control is normal. Um, Like I don't have that with the other sports. Like I've never, I've never had that really. Whereas swimming, it's horrendous. Um, And I think being okay to go a bit slower as well is also fine. But I think it just changes. I think you just have to adapt. And that's why it's really hard. And swimming is really hard. And knowing that, I saw a really nice graph that made me feel better about myself. And it was like one of the best swimmers in the world. I think it was pre-world champs. And she took three years where she plateaued, not even a second quicker in three years. And then suddenly she dropped a second and then another two seconds the next year and bam, world champion, world record. So I think it's a persistence thing. And the biggest thing, not just this year, but for me overall with swimming has been the, the sort of change in mindset of um, target setting. So the effort used to be getting to the pool and ugh, swimming, I've got to swim. N- now it was like, cool, I've made a decision that I want to swim at least, like insert an achievable kilometre goal here. For me, it was 20K. That's changed. It's now 18. Um, but it could be 10, it could be 12, 15, like it, I want to swim at least 18 kilometers a week, regardless of how that looks. So I then stopped worrying about every session I was going to. It was like, cool, well, I only have to, I just have to do 3K today. 
it doesn't matter what it looks mm. like. So I stopped worrying that it was going to be a bad swim or it was going to be too hard. It was just, so well, I've just got to get through 3K. Um, and that was really big for me in 2020, 2021. Um, so yeah, that would be mine, like set a totally achievable goal as your baseline. And then there's so many other things that you can progress into, like we've chatted to today, technique, structure, effort, confidence. Mm. Kat, that is a great, great way to end the podcast. I appreciate you sticking around. I know we've gone a little bit over time and you are, you'll you have to head off here, but um, that, that was terrific to hear. Very thoughtful about the way that you, um, about your approach to swimming and triathlon. And uh, I think for, for the listeners of the podcast, they'll get a lot out of it. Uh, listening to the changes that you've made to your swimming and and how you've how you've thought about it, so I appreciate you sharing that on the podcast. And it's been great to watch your watch your journey over the last couple of years. And uh, I appreciate you being on here. So uh, thank you, and I uh, can't wait to get you back on here. Thanks so much. And no, all of the thank you goes to you and your platform because I didn't get the opportunity to say that I think most of my swimming technique comes from your Instagram. So I just that should be known <laughs> so thank you oh uh, yeah i pre- i as i said before the podcast i get a huge kick out of that that uh someone at, at your level uh in triathlon is able to benefit from some of the videos that i do because I put a lot of effort into it I, I love helping people i love working with people and uh, the fact that that it's been able to help you um I, I really get a kick out of it so i appreciate that and um, yeah, looking forward to, uh, to your journey over the next couple of years. So uh, thanks again, Kat. Thank you. Thanks for having me.